Liquidity begets liquidity. So where there is volume and there is depth in the order book, there's going to be more flow to there naturally. The structure has changed in the market and that's not always showing up in prices, but it's showing up in execution and in reliability. And that's what matters. Hello and welcome back to the Binance Studios. Now in this video, we're going to break down how market liquidity and crypto liquidity actually works, but also why it matters for everyday cryptocurrency users, not just traders. We'll be using fresh data and metrics from the Piker Research Report and joining me to break everything down on Binance's liquidity flywheel and what it needs for the crypto market moving forward is Adam, Head of Research at Kaiko. So Adam, starting off, if we look at the cryptocurrency ecosystem and environment in 2017, we saw Binance launch in 2017. Before then, what was the market experience like for cryptocurrency traders and what were some of the problems they were possibly encountering? And then on top of that, when it comes to Binance entering the market, the exchange from user metric did grow extremely quickly. What do you think were some of the reasonings for this quick user acquisition? Yeah, for sure. I think I was that was right around when I got into crypto the first time I was in university. Right. Um, you know, I was interested in finance. I think but I had like grand illusions of being like working in banking or trading, whatever. And crypto was kind of cool. You know, it gave you kind of exposure to all of those things that were apparently, um, you know, out of your reach unless you could uh, get a first uh, class honors degree in a top university. But you could suddenly be trading and, and making money. So it was cool. I think what sort of signified the market right around then or what like, really kind of defined it was there was only a few venues you know it was a couple of years after the Mt. Gox collapse there wasn't that much uh, in way of like you know user experience wasn't priority it was kind of getting people on board getting people using things I used some exchanges that were clunky they were tough I used Binance and it was one of the easier ones to use for sure I still use Binance now as well as a couple of other exchanges you know but the the, the landscape back then kind of 2016 leading 2017 it was smaller it was more fragmented uh, there wasn't as much opportunity. I think, you know, some exchanges have maybe three or four tokens and it was just, you know, harder to kind of get on board, harder to on-ramp to crypto. Um, so that was what kind of signified things back then. I think peer-to-peer -peer trading was still more of a thing. Now we have no peer-to-peer -peer venues really left. Uh, so it was a much different market. You know, there was nowhere near as much volume. There was no nowhere near as much institutional in interest. And it was very much a kind of niche niche topic you know the people weren't ready to touch yet there wasn't you know the black rocks of the world the fidelities of the world's running bitcoin etfs those were a distant kind of you know dream back then one thing that i'd like to focus on next is looking at something that you really highlighted in your report which is finance's early focus on on stable coins and not just stable coins on their own but also stable coin denominated trading pairs just something that wasn't typically conventional what we saw in the cryptocurrency exchanges so maybe for our viewers, just to highlight why that was unique, why it hadn't been seen before, and then also why it was an important decision that has impacted cryptocurrency users moving forward. Yeah, for sure. I think if we go back to like what the exchange landscape was like back then, it was um, obviously smaller and fragmented, but that was also quite regional in ways where you might onboard with like a bank transfer to a bank or, you know, sometimes I think I use PayPal or other things where you were kind of using older rails, more traditional rails. It was harder to get on. And so things were kind of siloed away in different places. But the thing with stable coins and why they're still so important today, even, you know, beyond just, you know, C uh, CFI, but even in DeFi and everywhere, and we're seeing more and more big players use stable coins is because they allow kind of global access instantly. Um, you know, the speed at which you can get in and out of positions with stable coins or even get onboarded is so much quicker. You're seeing Visa, you're seeing MasterCard. Everyone wants a stable coin project now for that reason. Centralized exchanges like Binance saw that, you know, 10 years ago nearly now when they were launching. And, and the benefit of that was, you know, you could be global anywhere using a stable coin. It was harder maybe to get dollars onto an account. You had to maybe, you know, do different kind of uh, jump through different hoops to do that. But stable coins were the nice in between where you could get that dollar exposure you could have liquid pairs and still get access. So focusing on having a broad range of stablecoin pairs open up the market to more people and more times, like, you know, more kind of globally. So like the, the importance of that isn't just that you've got users in, you know, APAC and North America and Europe and Australasia, wherever. It's that you also have a liquidity throughout the day. Um, for sure, crypto liquidity wasn't as strong back then anywhere but there was like you know before we had more stable coins and pairs and bigger global exchanges there were more kind of liquidity gaps and time time like 
periods, you know, Sunday evenings have always been a big thing in crypto where, you know, the Asian market's opening and things start pushing up. There was a lot more of those kind of gapping up moves and gapping down in prices when there was less, you know, kind of uniformity across the market, which improves efficiency. So when you have kind of, you know, a few stablecoin pairs that have a lot of, um, a lot of liquidity, a lot of volume that opened that kind of smooths things out throughout the day because you've got market makers on those stable coins. You've got people who are willing to quote them and it's easier cross venue kind of movements. Whereas, you know, if you're using US dollar or one venue euros and Turkish lira, it's kind of having that USDT or USDC, whatever stable coin you want to use. I think it was USDT pr primarily back then, but those allow you to kind of remove that friction, that risk. One of the key terms that you guys have used in Kaiko was the liquidity flywheel in the report. Could you explain that idea for the users in a simple term, people that are watching what the liquidity flywheel means and then how it alludes into this specific report? Yeah, I think um, the way I like usually explain this to like clients or anyone I'm speaking with is like liquidity begets liquidity. So where there is volume and there is depth in the order book, there's going to be more flow to there naturally. So I guess the flywheel here is like in the simplest sense, what we mean by liquidity is, is a few things. How easy is it to convert your position back into cash or into, you know, stable coins? And then, you know, what's the volume like? How consistent is that throughout the day, throughout the week, throughout the month? So that's like a few things for me. What's the volume like? Have you got consistent volumes? Have you got, have you got market depth that matches that? So, you know, we measure that in terms of the depth from the mid price. So 1%, 2%, sometimes even as small as 10 bips for the mid price. And we summed it both sides, the bid and asks. So this, this kind of healthiness of the order book there feeds into liquidity. And once that matches with volume, then you've kind of, you know, you've, you're lucky, you're onto a winner. Sometimes you can see more volume than there is liquidity, than there is like depth, and you're kind of seeing a mismatch there. It's a bit of a warning sign. But one of the things with kind of Binance and other large exchanges in crypto is that you're seeing more and more over the last five, six, seven or eight years is like that liquidity, that volume is being matched with more liquidity. It means basically there's more market makers, there's more people that are helping to keep things kind of efficient. That means you can convert your position into cash more easily, more readily, which makes it better and uh, easier to trade. So you're naturally going to have a flywheel there where you know, you're getting that volume, you're getting that liquidity. All of a sudden, people are saying, that's the venue where I'm going to execute. There's only a few of those in crypto right now um, because, yeah, you know, that's where flow, 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 flow follows flow a lot of the time. So it's hard to kind of usurp that. Once you get it, it's a, sort of a, a reinforcing kind of, thing that will will just build uh and build ideally as the market grows um and it just you know it's it uh, reinforces like reliability and usability essentially and now looking ahead to kind of top catalysts and drivers for liquidity movements you're like oh this is the million dollar question so we've got institutional participation we've got the markets being better capitalized regulation we've got a little bit more clarity in the space from 2025 uh, moving forward now to 2026 is there any other drivers that our audience can take away as key metrics that could be possible uh liquidity movers yeah i think you know we're seeing the regulation is an important one uh obviously like you guys had the adgm um first exchange to get that recently you've got more things happening as well that like aren't even exchange specific you're seeing regulators themselves changing their tone you know the sec is um releasing kind of updates weekly from paul atkins her, uh, hester pierce on their approach to crypto which is something we just didn't have um for the last 10 years so that kind of thing that crypto is just a normal thing to talk about now that can't be overstated um you know that it's okay for paul atkins the chair of the sec to talk about crypto in a positive light there's things happening with tokenization that they're supporting with the dttc and the canton network now for instance those things can't be overstated. I think they're huge drivers for liquidity and they'll feed into the flywheel for, for, for major exchanges like Binance. That when more and more people are, are comfortable talking about crypto, then it's going to change things. When I first worked in this space and you were chatting to people about it, you were a pariah. It was a little like, oh, what are you really going to do after that? Now it's kind of more inquisitive and coming, questions coming from the right place. People are interested in it and they're kind of a healthy uh, you know, desire to learn rather than a healthy skepticism, which we were happy with maybe a few years ago. So I think that attitude shift can't be overstated. And I think in line with that as well as there's more products and more more tradable products. You know, you're seeing perks are growing now across the globe and coming to America for the first time. That's huge. I think it's one of the main innovations of crypto. Um, I will really drive adoption because it, it's essentially a very nice, like interesting product way of trading crypto. I think it could have advances in other markets too. So crypto will start finally influencing 
developments in let's maybe say you know emerging markets fx perps could be a cool uh product for those na- those uh traders we'll see more of that and once crypto starts to influence other markets in that way then there will be you know kind of more trading there i think one of the other things regulation allows is that you know i think it's ben effort one of the qv uh hedge funds volatility hedge fund in the us they're now opening a crypto desk now the volatility in crypto is compressing over time but it's still there and the fact that they're happy to open a desk it means that the counterparty risk isn't as big, I guess, and you know they're comfortable with that more and more and more now because the volatility has been there for years. But now they're willing to trade it because there's the rails in place. So those things are huge. So when we see the big names of the hedge funds that are getting involved in crypto, pension funds buying ETFs, those things are huge. But also, you know, opening up access to retail users and um, kind of increasing how people kind of get on board with crypto is is another way. I know that. Um, I think you know Binance does a lot of that as well. Uh, it's a great way of getting people on board. You're seeing more of that as well with some re- some of the trading activity on Binance now. Is that there's more retail comfortable there. Uh, you know the average trade sizes are lower, so that means we can infer from that maybe that there's more retail, which is a good thing. Uh, people are confident to kind of trade trade with confidence because over the last few months and years, maybe this market has been a bit more whale driven or driven by institutions. So it's good to see the retail users coming back, and that should be an encouraging sign for for liquidity as well. So Adam, finally, if we summarize where we have grown in the industry from 2017 all the way through to 2025, and now we're fast approaching 2026, this liquidity flywheel, it does keep continuing to grow for, for crypto, for the users, for the industry. What does that look like? Can you give us some glimpses based on the data and metrics that you guys have available? Yeah, I think one of the things we're seeing is that there's now like, you know, the capacity for ex- venues like Binance and others has grown massively. We're seeing 60 billion b- days of volume on some places, which is really stress testing the, the tech and the ability to kind of scale. Um, if we get more products, if we get more buy-in globally, there's a, a kind of um, synergy from regulators across the world and a kind of uniformity in that sense. I, I don't see why not in the next, you know, 12 to 18 months, we'll see 50, 60 billion dollar uh, kind of days for for most assets being a normal thing. So I think volumes will rise uh, sort of exponentially as regulation improves and crypto will kind of solidify as an asset class, maybe a little bit more narrow around, you know, the top 10 to 15 assets. It might, might not get a sort of De- DeFi summer thing where we're seeing 150 different assets trading lots of volume, that, but that's fine. It's a maturity thing. So I think that's one of the things I would expect to see is a lot more volume. We've now kind of shown that the capacity is there. Vo- venues can do this. Um, and that'll become more of a regular thing, consistently high volume across the top assets. Uh, but yeah, it'll be driven by regulation improving globally, which it has. You know, we've got ETFs on nearly the top ten products. I think now we've even got a, you know, a high PTF already launched in the US. So those things will be consistent liquidity floor. Um, beyond volumes and exchanges, I think tokenization is going to be a cool thing as well to watch. And there's other areas like that that we're seeing, which also feeds into the global broader liquidity because you've got you know, even if it's tokenizing, uh, you know, repo on chain or whatever it is, there are more people comfortable with crypto. There's more of it desks at market makers doing crypto. If they're doing one thing, they're kind of going to get into it all eventually. So, um, yeah, those are, the, those are the areas I see a lot of growth in over the next 12, 18 months. Fantastic. Well, watch this space and we'll have to have you come back on the channel every six months to do an, a check-in and sentiment and see how the markets are looking. Adam, thank you so much for the time. Really appreciate it. We will link the report down below for anyone that does want to have a wider look, but really appreciate your time today and the insights. So thank you for joining us. No worries. Thanks for having me. Happy to come back anytime.